we are able to defend ourselves. We never asked the United States to send Marines in Beirut. But if the Marines are there, it is in order to defend, to defend the legitimate Lebanese government, to prevent a Syrian Soviet domination of Lebanon. That's all. Looking at Jerusalem, where I interviewed Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir at his office today. Prime Minister Shamir is the seventh Prime Minister in the 35-year history of the State of Israel. His background is very interesting. He was not in the mainstream Haganah during the pre-state days. Rather, he was in the underground, both with Menachem Begin's Irgun and with the Stern Group as well. He has basically kept a relatively low profile in Israeli politics and is not very well known to the American public. One of the reasons for that is for many years he was a high official in Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, where for obvious reasons he had to maintain a low profile. He has been in the Knesset for many years. He was Speaker of the Knesset at the time that Sadat came to Jerusalem in 1977. He has been Foreign Minister and remains Foreign Minister uh, with his title of Prime Minister. He had some very interesting things to say, and I think the American public is going to see an aspect to Prime Minister Shamir not previously seen. He says that Israeli troops will positively not leave Lebanon unless Syrian troops do likewise. He is very firm on the fact that there will never be a dismantling of Israeli settlements in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. He had some very interesting things to say about former Prime Minister Begin and the qualities that Mr. Begin had which enabled him to maintain, maintain control over his political party while being in the opposition for three decades. You will see the sensitivity and strength of Yitzhak Shamir, the present Prime Minister of the State of Israel. It has been said that if Lebanon were a corporation, it would be bankrupt. There are many Americans who consider, who consider themselves pragmatists who say, look, realistically, the president of Lebanon, you can call him the president of Lebanon, but the reality is that on a good day, he doesn't even control Beirut. And such Americans ask, is it really realistic to expect that any time in, this, in the foreseeable future that Jamal is going to be the president of an independent country with a strong central government? Well, there is no doubt that... Uh uh, I mean, Jamal is the legitimate president of Lebanon. He was elected uh, by his parliament according to the constitution of Lebanon. And it is in the interests of the free world, including the United States and thus Israel, that uh, Lebanon has to have a stable government. In other words, you can't withdraw until there is a, a relatively course, strong, course, stable government. Of course, we have to leave the territories we will leave in Lebanon. We have to give them to any stable authority which will uh, take care of this territory and not per permit uh, foreign factors like terrorists to come back to this territory and to attack Israel from there. The Syrians obviously read the newspapers, both in Israel and the United States. Realistically speaking, they know that the American government, especially with presidential elections coming up, and all the Democratic candidates are to the left of President Reagan, and much less likely to support a peacekeeping force of Marines in Lebanon. They know that Israel is not going to go to war against Syria to get Syria out of Lebanon. 
They know that the American government is not going to put in a tremendous amount more of Marines. So why, realistically speaking, from the Syrian standpoint, would they leave Lebanon? You know, it's true that they, uh, that they know from the newspapers, from our statements, from our speeches, that Israel is not interested to wage any war against Syria. But they have to know that Israel will not abandon its interests, its security. And Israel is ready to defend its security against Syrians or against anywho, anywho. And uh, I think I cannot speak on behalf of the United States. Of course, nobody is interested in the United States to keep forever or for a long time American Marines there. But I think the Syrians are convinced that no American government will permit Syria to dominate all of Lebanon and to make of it again a, uh, a pro-Soviet uh, territory. Well, not all of Lebanon, but the part they're in right now. Obviously, Israel is not going to permit Syria to go into southern Lebanon. Well, but the aim of Syria is to dominate all of Lebanon, not only to keep this territory which they are, they are occupying now. They want to have all the Lebanese government under their control. They want to control Beirut also. It's not only the question of this 60% of the Lebanese territory which uh, they, they have now in their hands. And therefore, not Israel and not the United States will permit them to dominate all of Lebanon because, you know, the Lebanon is now the stage for this uh, east-west confrontation. If they will uh, succeed to get this uh, upper hand on Lebanon, Lebanon will become a farther territory under Soviet control. And I don't think anybody in the free world will uh, agree to it. Are the American Marines today in Lebanon because your country wants them to be there? Not at all. We never asked for it. You know, the pre one of the main principles of our policy was and is all the time that we are not asking anybody, any government, any country to come and defend us. We are able to defend ourselves. We never asked the United States to send Marines in Beirut. But if the Marines are there, it is in order to defend, to defend the legitimate Lebanese government, to prevent a Syrian Soviet domination of Lebanon. That's all. Mr. Prime Minister, as you know better than anyone, since Israel went into Lebanon in June of 1982, Israel has paid a very, very heavy price, approximately 560 Israeli deaths. With the benefit of hindsight, was that price worth it for the benefits achieved by Israel by going into Lebanon? You know, it's very, very, very difficult to, to make such uh, evaluations. We are defending our security, and it was intolerable. We couldn't tolerate the existence of a PLO organized uh, almost an army on the north of our frontiers attacking us every day and night. It was intolerable. And we were obliged to put an end to it. And we succeeded. We succeeded to do it. You know, when you are fighting for your independence, for your security, there is, there is no room for making uh, accounts. How many, how many losses you have or you had. It was something Israel had to do. Yes, without doubt. Without doubt. Looking at the Middle East generally, the Arab world, 
Iran is fighting Iraq. Syria and Jordan have been at each other's throats. Egypt and Libya have been at each other's throats. Revolution, assassination is, as you know, very, very common in the Arab world. There are no democratic countries in the Arab world. Since Israelis are considered to be so persuasive, why has Israel always failed in convincing the United States government that Israel should be their ally, not necessarily their sole ally, but over a period of years, America has constantly put pressure on Israel to make concessions. Why doesn't the United States government see that Israel is basically the only reliable ally it can ever have in this region? And I'm sure <laughs> you and uh, your predecessors have tried to convince American well, presidents of that. Yes, of course. Well, I cannot explain the American positions, you know. It's up to them uh, to explain it, uh, all this uh, historical uh, development of the relations between the United States and, uh, and Israel. There were uh, ups and downs. I think uh, now uh, we have uh, very good relations uh, with the United States, and the United States government understands uh, uh, the position of Israel and understands the necessity to cooperate with us. There is not uh, any, uh, any antagonism between uh, having friendship with the United, with the Arab countries and with the State of Israel. And of well, course... Unless, of course, it involves giving AWACS to Saudi Arabia well, or forming a, a secret strike force with well, Jordan. Well, there is uh, sometimes dilemmas. And, uh, of course, the American governments have to decide about it. We try to convince the American governments that our positions are right. Well, we have to do it. And about uh, a democracy in our region, it's known that uh, Israel is the only democracy in this area. And I must admit that is, this is one of the difficulties in our relations with the Arab countries. Because this difference of regime, of system of government, of mentality, it's very difficult to find an understanding to find a common language with our neighbors. And I, I am afraid that people outside the region do not understand this difficulty. And of course, uh, we will be forever a democracy. We will not change uh, our uh, system. And you know, I see very, very little, very few chances that the, our neighbors will become uh, democracies. I must say with regret that for them, democracy says nothing. And it is, that is a difficulty. It is a difficulty. In December of 1983, King Hussein appeared on American television. And even though the PLO has essentially been destroyed as a cohesive, organized body, King Hussein seems to be as timid as ever. He keeps talking about Resolution 242, a just and durable peace, but his bottom line is that Judea and Samaria must be under Arab sovereignty and the settlements in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, must be dismantled. Don't you think it's about time? I mean, after all, it's five years since Camp David was signed, since uh, autonomy was discussed, that the American government and the Israeli government give King Hussein a deadline and say either you come in under the Camp David autonomy talks within three months or six months, or we will talk to someone else. Is there anyone else to talk to? I don't think uh, we need a deadline. We are optimists, you know, we are great believers. And in spite of uh, all these uh, statements of King Hussein, uh, we still believe that uh, a day will come and we will be able to find uh, some acceptable solutions and some understandings because one, 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 one thing is clear that we and the Arabs we will live forever in this part of the world and therefore we have to find a political way how to coexist and I have the feeling that the King Hussein understands it and therefore we have to meet and talk he knows our positions, we know his positions. Even though you're not talking directly. Yeah, we know it. And this, they are different. There is a big a gap between uh, 
uh, our views and the views of King Hussein. And in spite of it, I believe that it is worthwhile to meet and talk, because without talking, there is no hope for uh, any kind, for any chance to bridge the gaps between us. Mr. Prime Minister, the American people really don't know the, prime, the present Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Shamir, all that well. And preparing for this interview, I read all the newspapers, and basically what the American press kept saying about you was pretty much as follows. And when I get done with a little background, I'm going to ask you if it's accurate, and if it's not, please enlighten us. Uh, you were a former underground guerrilla, a former high official in Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA. Of course, everyone knows you were Speaker of the Knesset. You, have, you are presently still a foreign minister. They say that you are a man who believes in governing by consensus. You know how to delegate authority. You are a team player. You tend to be very secretive, uh, playing your cards very close to the vest, to use an American expression. And some of the so-called pundits see you as a transitional figure, uh, because we know there was a fight for the prime ministership after Prime Minister Begin resigned. And these are the essential things they say in describing you. Accurate or inaccurate? <laughs> you know, I am not an expert. <laughs> You're an expert, I do. <laughs> <laughs> on my chances, on my future. Uh, I, know, I know a little bit about my past. <laughs> Tell us about that. But nothing about my future, you know. Uh, but, uh, well, I thank you for all the compliments. <laughs> you know, to me, I think that uh, since uh, the, the beginning of my uh, political uh, activity, the, uh, my uh, slogan was to serve our people, to do the utmost of my uh, possibilities and capabilities to liberate our people. It was before the establishment of the state and afterwards to make the state and the people stronger. And I'm still faithful to this, uh, to this purpose. And you know, a man in my age couldn't change himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. Uh, Talking about you, I th uh, obviously Prime Minister Begin is much better known in the United States after having served as long as he did and with all the media coverage of Camp David. I think it, in a sense that when history judges Prime Minister Begin, one of the most extraordinary things about him is the fact that out of power for the first 29 years of Israel's existence, in a country with as many differences of opinion amongst the Jews, amongst the Israelis as Israel had, that he was able to maintain the hold, the leadership, on his parties for three decades out of power. Now, you know him so very well. What personal qualities, what oh, charisma no. did the man have, does well, the man well, have, that enabled him to do that? Well, we are talking about a very great personality in our history and maybe in the history of the world. You have mentioned the 30 years, 29 years of his being in opposition. It was very hard. And you know, in this time, there are many people who have uh, said all the time, he will never come to, to, to power, he will never be a prim, prime minister. And he was sure, he will be, he was sure. And teached us democracy as a leader of opposition. You know, we, all of us came from the underground. In the underground, you do not have any democratic rules. We, all of us, we have been fighters, we have been members of fighting organizations. And after the establishment of the state, he has learned us, all this is over. Now we have to keep our democratic country. Now only the ballot 
will decide who will be in government. And for us, member, former members of the underground, it was very hard to accept. And if we accepted it, it is because of him. And he had that kind of magnetism, yes, that kind of charisma. Yes, yes, because he's a great believer. And he has the capacity to convince his friends, his followers. Everybody knows that he means what he says. And he identifies himself with all his ideology, his philosophy. And we believe his philosophy is the philosophy on which we have to build our state, our statehood. Mr. Prime Minister, in interviewing major figures in Israel, actually the, the spectrum from far left to far right, it seems to me what I've gotten out of it in general, that on three major issues there seems to be total consensus within the state of Israel. Number one, Jerusalem will never be divided. Number two, Israel will never go back to its pre-1967 borders. And number three, there will never be an independent, sovereign Palestinian state between Israel and Jordan. Is, is that fair? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think that is a national consensus. The Arabs would say to you, Hussein, I think, would say to you, if he would talk to you directly, taking that as a national consensus, what is there really to talk about? Because when I've interviewed people like Ashawa, Arab representatives, they begin, their, their absolutely beginning point, and of course ending point is, this independent, sovereign yes. state between Jordan and Israel on the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and obviously the Israeli consensus is, we'll give you autonomy, we'll give you a lot of freedom, we can work out all kinds of arrangements, but if you want a state with a government on the West Bank, you are never going to get it. You are right, uh, you are right. Uh, I heard Hussein in his last interview, he said, total withdrawal. It's not acceptable to any of the Israelis, maybe with the exception of a very small uh, minority. But you know, the same happened in Camp David, when uh, Prime Minister Begin met a Sadat. Well, the position of Sadat was well known, total withdrawal. Begin was totally opposed to it. And therefore, they decided they decided to establish a transitional period of autonomy. Five years. Five years. And the rationale of this solution was that if during this period of five years autonomy, there will be a peaceful coexistence between Palestinian Arabs and Israelis, a climate of mutual confidence will emerge. And maybe in this climate, after five years, people will be able to find acceptable solutions to all parties, by all parties. The critics of Israel say, you're building settlements in Judea and Samaria to establish facts, with the ultimate goal being annexation. Is that a fair criticism? Not at all, you know. The, the, the building of villages and of cities has nothing to do with the Camp David agreements, with our readiness to negotiate about the political status, about the stable status of these uh, uh, territories of Judea and Samaria. Because uh, we will never accept any decision that uh, uh, Jews or Israelis have no right to live in any part of the country. And what we are doing all the time, since we came to, to this country... Well, that's the question. Is, is, is that build, the country? Is, 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 is Judea and Samaria Israel? Well, it's a fact that it's a part of the land of Israel. And now, okay, we have differences of views about our frontiers, but it was never a question if we have or we have not the right to build anywhere in this country. There is a difference about 
the political status of parts of our country or of all of the country, you know, because uh, if we will be sincere, if Arabs will be sincere, they want to have a Palestinian state all over the country, not only in Samaria, Judea, and Gaza. But let us uh, put aside that. But about it, about the political status, we are ready to negotiate according to our obligations, to our commitments in Camp David. And I think that is the only way, the only way to find someday an acceptable solution, a peaceful solution. When the Sinai was returned under Camp David, there were people that said that they would never dismantle Jewish settlements. And of course, that happened yes. under Camp David with the return of Sinai. Yes. Could you foresee that ever happening, regardless of what ultimate accommodation is made in Judea and Samaria? Never. They are there to stay 100%. They will stay there forever, forever. They will never be dismantled. There is a, of course not. It's a big difference between Sinai and Samaria and Judea. You know, we have never had historical claims to Sinai. Never. And I don't think it was necessary to dismantle our villages in Sinai. But the Egyptian uh, position was uh, very firm about it. And well, it was a price we have decided to, to pay. As a matter of fact, for, initially you, you were this. against Camp David of when you were Of course, because Kinesi. I didn't accept this position, this clause about our right to live there and about the frontier. But, well, after the Knesset accepted it, I, uh, I came along. But I don't think that there will be any situation in the future where any, any Israeli government will accept this approach of total withdrawal and of dismantling of Israeli settlements. Even they have a, to forget about it. Even a government headed by Shimon Peres? Any government. Would not accept that? No, never. Mr. Prime Minister, thank no. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.